Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk, featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within one square mile of the West End. Today's episode is a guided walk of the brutal murder of Ginger Ray, a veteran sex worker with a sweet smile and a kind heart, whose bloody death remains shrouded in so much myth and mystery that almost 70 years on, her murder may remain unsolved forever. Murder Mile contains vivid descriptions, which may not be suitable for those of a sensitive disposition, as well as photos, videos and maps which accompany this series, so that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 8 The Brutal Death of Ginger Ray. Today, once again, I'm standing on Broadwick Street, W1, a monstrously modern yet curiously cobblestone side street just 200 feet from the surgery of Isidore Ziefert, the deadliest dentist in Soho, as witnessed in episode 6. But the Broadwick Street of today has been renamed, renumbered and rebuilt so many times that it now has no idea what it is. Being dotted with an odd mix of stubbornly antiquated pubs with strangely sticky floors, nondescript buildings full of faceless office drones, and quirky cosmopolitan coffee shops which require you take out a loan to buy a latte. Three years after the end of World War II, Broadwick Street, like most of Soho, was a hotbed of prostitution. As with the city's severely depleted police force already stretched to capacity as they struggled to regain control and quell the escalating crime wave. And although the Second World War for most people, was a distant memory. The financially crippled and emotionally broken people of Britain were still living in the grip of rationing, which meant that as many enlisted service personnel returned home to find they had no job, no money and no food. Being distraught at having won the war, and yet struggling and starving, they started to question whether they'd won at all. Even many an honest man and woman turned to crime, simply to stay alive. So by 1948, eight years after rationing began, with everyday essentials like butter, sugar, eggs, milk, meat, flour, fuel, and even clothes in strictly limited supply, a black market was flourishing, theft was endemic, and prostitution was rife. And owing to Broadwick Street's proximity in London's West End, Given the many pubs which peppered the streets and the ridiculously cheap rent of its dilapidated and bombed out houses, after four Nazi bombs which landed within 150 feet of each other had reduced the street to a mangled mess of structurally unsafe slum houses, by 1948 the street was still strewn with rubble and littered with precariously cheap lodgings, many of which had become brothels. One of those lodgings was 46 Broadwick Street, a shabby two-roomed flat where a seasoned Soho prostitute would miraculously survive the war, only to die during peacetime at the hands of a maniac. Today, 46 Broadwick Street looks similar to how it did 70 years ago, a tall, thin, four-storey brown brick townhouse, subdivided into small flats, with two white windows on each level, and accessed by a black door on the ground floor, all of which overlook the junction of Lexington Street, a murky side street that heads to the infamous Brewer Street, a place still famed for prostitution today. But back in 1948... The lodger in the second floor flat was a lady of the night, known locally as Ginger Ray. 
Born Rachel Annie Hatton in Hoxton, East London, on the 19th of August 1907, Ray was one of three siblings, with a brother Richard and a sister Maria, who she remained close to and would meet on a weekly basis for meals. Nicknamed Red Ray or Ginger Ray on account of her bright red hair, she was often described as a bright, breezy and easy-going girl who was very sociable and friendly. Although she had an extensive criminal record, having been a prostitute for 23 years, during which time she amassed a whopping 84 convictions for soliciting, including two charges of larceny, having pickpocketed two drunken punters, and two charges for brothel keeping, Ray didn't have any drink or drug issues. She didn't have any debts, and oddly, she actually seemed to enjoy and even embrace the lifestyle that prostitution had given her, including money in her pocket, food in her belly, an active social life, and a nice warm flat. And yet, having been in the sex trade for more than two-thirds of her life, Ray knew how to handle herself. She was feisty, sharp, and street smart, as well as a lady who everyone who knew her widely agreed was not one to be trifled with, especially after she'd had a few drinks. But at the tender age of just 26, having been cruelly widowed one year into her marriage to an African-American stage actor called Herbert Fennick, who tragically died in a Parisian car crash, Ray kept his name and never remarried. Instead, choosing to lavish the malnourished street kids with sweet treats, sharing her flat with friends in need, and being a loyal, loving and caring companion to her many gentlemen callers. Ray lived in Soho for over 20 years, and during the summer of 1945, she moved into the bomb-damaged but equally serviceable second-floor flat at 46 Broadwick Street. Three years later, she would be dead. Saturday the 25th of September 1948 was the last day of Ginger Ray's life. And like most of the days leading up to that, it was unremarkable. As was her regular Saturday routine, she hopped on a bus and had taken the 40-minute trip to Dalston Junction to go shopping in the East End of London and have a spot of lunch in a cafe near the Metropolitan Hotel with her gentleman friend, Ted. Ted, or Eddie as he was known, was born Edwin George Peggs. He was a 41-year-old, bulky, but sweet-natured man who lived in a small lodging in the Samuel Lewis building in Dulston Lane. And although he was trained as a tailor's outfitter, the post-war years had been cruel, and therefore he hadn't worked in 12 months. But with Ray having such a strong maternal instinct towards her many gentlemen callers, she'd always treat him to lunch on a Saturday, a roast chicken dinner on a Sunday, and a few little gifts during the week to keep his strength up, as well as providing him with money, food, and a warm bed when he needed it. And although they were never a couple, Ted and Ray neither argued nor fought, as their relationship was built on companionship, love, and trust. After a delightful lunch, they both parted ways with a kiss and a hug with Ray taking a short walk to Hoxton to visit her beloved sister, Maria, and Ted heading back to his Dalston flat. And having agreed that Ted would call on Ray the following morning for Sunday lunch, on her way home, Ray picked up a chicken, a few potatoes, and some salad. But as Ray returned home to her second floor flat, being such a social person, she couldn't help but feel how quiet and empty her flat 
and even her life felt when there was no one there to share it. Up until a few weeks prior, Ray had opened her doors to a friend in need, a lady called Kay. But with Ray having helped to get Kay back onto her feet and moved her into her own rented lodgings just one street away on Wardour Street, even though they still met for drinks at the Sun and Thirteen Cantons public house most nights, it wasn't the same. Maybe it was fueled by the fear of loss and the loneliness having been widowed at such a young age that made Ray so keen for companionship but so reluctant to commit, which drove her to have so many men friends in her life, as by the time of her tragic death, Ray had three. Ted, the unemployed outfitter from Dalston, Antonio Ianu, a 28-year-old Greek Cypriot chef who lived with Ray for five weeks just one year prior, but being unable to pay his share of the bills and with pride getting the better of him, he moved out and yet they remained on good terms. And third of her gentleman callers was 23-year-old Arthur William Steed. Now, it's normally in this point of the story where having mentioned a name that I'd usually play this. Signifying that the person in question is a villain, a wrong'un, and a no-good worthless piece of poo, who is most likely to be our chief suspect in the murder of Ginger Ray. But he isn't. In fact, of all of the gentlemen friends who Ray shared those last few days with, all were sweet, polite, and pleasant. Delicate little flowers who needed a mother figure to protect and pamper them, and who were all attracted to her big heart, her gentle smile, and her kind streak, which was a mile wide. And as mentioned before, she had no debts, no drug issues, and no dark past or dodgy dealings. She was loved, not loathed. She was caring, not cruel. Nothing out of the ordinary had happened. And yet, just a few hours later, Ginger Ray would be brutally stabbed to death. That evening, at around 8pm, as Ray was getting ready to ready herself for her usual Saturday night, to sell her body for sex, whilst also finding time to socialise with friends, Ray would eat a light meal, which, according to her autopsy, mostly consisted of peas, and although she was drinking, in those few hours up until her death, she would only consume one pint of beer, meaning she drank, but she wasn't drunk. At 8.15pm, having donned a black dress, a white blouse, white-heeled shoes, and a white raincoat, with her bright auburn hair brushed up and over her head, Ray headed out of the black front door, a 46 Broadwick Street and walked south along Lexington Street towards the infamous red light district of Brewer Street, which was her usual patch for picking up punters. This sighting was made by Mrs. Frances Slater, a resident in the top floor flat of 15 Lexington Street, who knew Ray, her occupation, her route and many of her regular customers and confirmed that between 8.15pm and 10pm, as per usual, she saw Ray repeatedly walking a procession of men back to her flat for the purposes of sex. According to Arthur William Steed, the 23-year-old storesman, who was the third of Ray's current slew of gentlemen callers, she had previously agreed to meet him at 10pm, in the Sun and Thirteen Cantons public house on Great Pulteney Street, a side street which runs parallel to Lexington Street and is halfway between Brewer Street and her flat, just a three-minute walk away. Having arrived early, Steed sat at the bar, supping a cold pint with his friend Reginald Dutton, who Ray knew, as Dutton used to date Ray's former flatmate Kay and would often make up a foursome but tonight, 
with Kay being away in Leytonstone to meet a male friend. It would just be the three of them. But by 10.40pm, Ginger Ray hadn't shown up. For those who knew her, Ginger Ray was a creature of habit, who saw prostitution as merely a means to an end, and would work a maximum of two to three hours a day, six days a week, and never on a Sunday. And yet, even though she wasn't the most punctual of people, she would never let her sex work interfere with her social life. She was not known to let her friends down. And according to Steed's own witness testimony, it was her habit to have packed up business by 10pm so she could go out for a drink. A statement which was clarified by Patrick Joseph Lister, the licensee of the Sun and 13 Cantons public house, who confirmed that Ray was a regular there, who used to drink a light ale in the public bar between 9pm and 11pm on most weekdays, with either Steed K or Ted. With her flat at 46 Broadwick Street being just one street away, Steed and Dutton swung by and noticed that the lights in her flat were on, something she would always do whenever she was out soliciting. So assuming that she was either inside with a client or still out on the streets, they parted ways. The next morning, on Sunday the 26th of September 1948, at 11am, sensing that Ray's failure to turn up was out of character, and living in Silver Street just one road away, Steed and Dutton stopped by her flat to check that she was okay. As per usual, the front door was locked, and as hard as they knocked, there was no reply. But through the partially open curtains, they saw that the flickering gas lamp which illuminated her flat was still on, suggesting that either she was in or that she hadn't come home. Ten minutes later, Steed and Dutton decided to try again. But this time, as they approached the flat, they noticed that the black front door on the ground floor was now open. And with this being the only entrance or exit to the flats above, they walked up two flights of stairs and knocked on Ray's door. But once again, there was no reply. At 12.45pm, a full 15 minutes early for their pre-arranged lunch date, Ray's regular gentleman caller, Ted, arrived at her flat, only to be greeted in the hallway by William Yates, a stableman who lived with his wife Margaret in the top floor flat, and shared his grave concerns with Ted. Not having a key, Ted used his 16 stone bulk to break a panel in the side door and entered the flat via the kitchen. Ray! he hollered, Getting no reply, but noticing the uncooked chicken she had bought for their Sunday lunch, and the salad ready to be washed in the basin. Ray! he bellowed into the bathroom, his frantic voice echoing into the inky blackness. And yet, as he pushed open the last door which led to her front room, he saw no sign of Ray, only a set of folded clothes on her dresser an unmade bed, and a crumpled eiderdown on the floor. And as he went to shout out her name one last time, his voice was cut short by the shocking sight before him. Detective Sergeant Billiard of West End Central Police Station was the first officer on the scene at 1.15pm, followed by Detective Inspector Watts and Dr. Kennedy the divisional surgeon at 1.55pm, who confirmed that Rachel Annie Fennick, alias Ginger Ray, was dead. 
underneath the softness of the crumpled eiderdown. The lower half of Ray's pale and bloody torso was sticking out. And although she was partially clothed, wearing stockings, a slip and a brassiere, her legs were splayed akimbo, her abdomen exposed and her bare genitals on show. With no one knowing whether she had been hastily hidden or deliberately posed for effect. Across the fingers and palms of her left hand, Ray had sustained several lacerations, suggesting either defensive wounds as she fought to protect herself or as she grabbed the blade to fight off her attacker. Over her throat, a deep dark bruise in the shape of a thumb had made an indentation across her windpipe, suggesting she'd been strangled. And in total, Ray had been stabbed six times, with such violence and force that the full length of the seven-inch blade had penetrated her torso, rupturing her stomach, liver, kidneys, bowel, and causing both lungs to collapse. With a blood spatter, which had sprayed and pulled around her mouth, signifying that during this painful and terrifying last two to three minutes of Ray's life, that while struggling to breathe, she had choked on her own blood. Police surmised that she'd been stabbed with a seven-inch stiletto-style blade, which is like a flick knife, only with a sharp edge on both sides of the blade. But sadly, the knife was never found. Robbery was considered, as four one-pound notes were stolen from her purse, as well as two pairs of cami knickers from her drawer. And rape was ruled out, as there was no signs of sexual violence, no sex had taken place, and no semen was found on her vaginal pad. Whoever had killed her had done so with a lot of violence, a lot of anger, and a lot of hatred. So who killed Ginger Ray? Quickly, the police ruled out her gentleman friends, as not only did they have no hatred for Ray, only love, but also all three of them had alibis. Edwin George Peggs, also known as Ted, the 41-year-old tailor's outfitter who had discovered her body, was in Dalston on the night of her death, as confirmed by multiple witnesses. Antonio Ianu, the 28-year-old chef who lived with Ray for five weeks, had his clothes and a similar knife examined by the police. But being a commie chef who owned loads of knives, and even though his whereabouts that night were a little vague, he was not deemed a suspect. And William Steed and Reginald Dutton, the two drinking pals who agreed to meet Ray in the Sun and Thirteen Cantons pub, were both witnessed in the pub until 10.40pm, and having been unable to find Ray, they returned home at 11.15pm, a sighting which was confirmed by their mothers. So what about witness statements? As we know, according to Mrs Francis Slater, who lived in the top floor flat of 15 Lexington Street, Ray left her flat at 8.15pm walked south to Brewer Street and ushered numerous men back to her flat for sex, many times over the next two hours. Then, at 9.30pm, Mrs Margaret Yates, who resided with her husband William in the top floor flat of 46 Broadwick Street, one floor above, heard Ray walking up the dark-lit staircase with a softly spoken man, to whom she said, This way, darling! To which he replied, This way? Before entering the flat. At 9.45pm, 15 minutes later, Mrs Yates heard a woman scream. Although, with a raucous party taking place in the Newcastle public house, now known as the John Snow, immediately opposite, it's impossible to tell whose scream that was. But the likelihood is, it wasn't Ray. At just after 10pm, Mrs Francis Slater 
saw Ray walking with a tall gentleman towards her flat. But owing to the streets being dark and him wearing a trilby hat, she couldn't see his face. And yet, at 10pm, this was the time when she was supposed to be meeting Steed and Dutton in the Sun and 13 Cantons public house, but didn't. And neither would she attempt to, as between 10.30pm and 10.40pm, she would be seen by Irene Hughes, another local prostitute on Brewer Street. At 10.40pm, Rebecca Howland, a prostitute on Brewer Street, saw Ray meeting a regular customer, a petty officer in the Navy, who was in his late 20s, with light hair, he was clean-shaven, who was well-built, and wearing a white-topped hat. And yet, even though none of these men could ever be traced, it's unlikely that any of them were the culprit. As with Dr. Kennedy conducting the initial examination of Ray's body at 3 p.m., and concluding that with rigor mortis having set in, that she must have been dead for 12 to 16 hours, that puts her time of death between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. After 11 p.m., there is only one confirmed sighting of Ginger Ray alive. Between 11.10 p.m. and 11.25 p.m., three prostitutes on Brewer Street, Thomasina Ingram, Alice Nolan and Rebecca Howland, all witnessed Ray engaged in a conversation with a customer, and their descriptions of him are excellent. He was in his mid-thirties, six foot tall, well-built, with a dark complexion, he had dark brush back hair, he was clean-shaven, with a Roman nose, thick lips, and uneven and unclean teeth. He was wearing a well-cut dark brown suit, which looked expensive, a white shirt, tan shoes, and he was carrying a light tan raincoat over his shoulder. Having spoken to that very same man just moments earlier, Rebecca Howland later stated that he kept looking at my mouth as if he was deaf and lip reading. And even though all three women confirmed that the man was foreign, Rebecca was able to narrow down his accent to either being Spanish Greek or Maltese. So who was this man? Still to this day, nobody knows and the case remains unsolved. Rachel Annie Hatton, alias Ginger Ray, was a 41-year-old Soho prostitute with no enemies, no debts and no drug habit. She was loved by many and supposedly loathed by no one. And yet someone had so much hatred for her that they subjected her to a brutal and bloody death. Their right hand squeezing her throat, their eyes staring at hers as the life drained out of her body. But why? Maybe she was murdered by a stranger who was stalking Soho's prostitutes. Maybe the police had already questioned her attacker, only to disregard him as a suspect and let him go. Maybe the veteran sex worker, Ginger Ray, was caught up in something secret, deadly and dangerous. Or maybe there's more to learn about this mysterious Maltese man. The brutal death of Ginger Ray continues next week. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. If you have any fingernails left, uh, feel free to ask me any questions about this episode via Facebook or Twitter, or I'm on Instagram as well. And if you enjoyed this podcast, please do like it on any social media and share it with your friends. And if you really enjoyed this podcast, why not take part in a Murder Mile walk? It's my guided walk of Soho's most infamous murder cases, totaling 12 murderers across 15 locations, totaling 50 mysterious deaths 
all in just one mile. Tickets are available via my website, murdermiletours.com. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Next week is the concluding part of the brutal death of Ginger Ray. Thank you and sleep well.